For years, many of us have heard the various Bible stories that make Sunday school exciting. We've heard the stories that our parents have told us growing up. We've heard them even in church. The stories that just make us go, wow. We hear the story of David as he defeats Goliath the giant with just a single stone. The story of Gideon who destroys an army of over 100,000 with 300 men. We've heard the terrible murderous events of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. We've heard the various stories that make the Old Testament the Old Testament, and we've heard the New Testament stories of Jesus doing every miracle from making water into wine to changing death into life. And even we know the Gospels like the back of our hands as we know his salvation story. From little on, we have been taught who the heroes are and who the villains are in the Bible. We have been taught who we should cheer for, who we should boo. If you think about the Pharisee, or excuse me, Pharaoh, and you think about Moses, we cheer for Moses, and we boo Pharaoh. When we think about David and Goliath, we cheer David, and we boo Goliath. And when we read about the Pharisees and Sadducees and pretty much anyone else, we cheer Anybody else and boo, the Pharisees and Sadducees. And as we read Luke 18 today, our gospel lesson, we heard just one more example of where these Pharisees have gone wrong. Here Jesus has given us this parable of a Pharisee who's supposed to be the religious leader lined up against the tax collector, the lowest of the low, the scum of the earth, the one who sold out to the Romans, the one who cheated his fellow countrymen, lined up right there next to the Pharisee, polishing his gold ring, standing there talking to God about how wonderful he is. He tithes on a regular basis. He doesn't just fast once a week, but twice a week. He prays at least three times a day. All in everyone's eyes, of course. Now, I don't think this parable was given just for the people of Jesus' day. I think as we read this parable, well, we can relate to it a little bit. In particular, I think we can relate to the tax collector. Whether in church or in private, we have stood before God and said like the tax collector, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. However, as we hear this parable, as we're led to look at the Pharisee and the tax collector, we have the habit of only comparing ourselves to the tax collector. And I'd like to pause for a moment right now for you to think about, are you a Pharisee or are you a tax collector? Now admittedly, this is a bit of a trick question because if you say that you are a Pharisee, well, then you are admitting to the sinful pride, and so you're admitting to guilt. If you say that you are the tax collector, well, again, well, you didn't admit to the pride. When we recognize our own humility, we often are led to the pride that comes with that. Things do not seem always appear as they seem. As we have that wonderful church leader, that excellent example for society in the Pharisee, Well, of course, we know his heart was not in the right place. His heart was focused on his self-centered attitude. On the other hand, we had the tax collector, the evil, the low. And his heart was in the right place. And so as we think about this Pharisee and this tax collector, as we think about our own lives, and as we consider who we are before God, we're forced to consider which we are. Are we the Pharisee or are we the tax collector? Here we sit on Sunday morning. We sing the hymns or maybe hum along if it's a new one like the sermon hymn was. We pray the prayers. We we say confession and absolution, right? We maybe go to fellowship afterwards. We listen to Bible study. And then on our way home, we... We either complain about the drivers being too fast or too slow, putting our lives at risk, 
And maybe we don't say it, but perhaps a rude phrase comes to our mind. We get home. We prepare to have a sumptuous breakfast. And we can smell the eggs and bacon cooking. And the eggs turn out to be a little rubbery. The bacon, crunchy. And we get irritated with our spouse, his or her cooking. Or maybe... Maybe it's not in our home lives, but maybe it's how we behave at work. We have all these forms of technology now, email, phone calls. We can call anyone in the world from anywhere. And instead of being encouraging, we are discouraging, tearing people down instead of building them up. Or maybe our sins are much more secret. Maybe our sinful lives are lives that we hide from everyone. Lives that we bury in the dark because we're too ashamed to look at them ourselves. Maybe our lives are lives that while we proclaim to be children of the Heavenly Father, are lives that reflect more of a self-serving, self-centered attitude. In many ways, we are all Pharisees. We fall in that villain category That category that we've learned to cheer against. That we've learned to boo. We fall into that category. Separated from God. But we have an excuse, right? We didn't have any control over it. Before we could even decide, as David tells us in Psalm 51, we were brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. So, so right? We, we, We have an excuse, don't we? We don't have to. No. All sin, as we know, is punishable by death. Whether it's in the light for all to see, or whether we hide it in the darkest corner. Our sinfulness separates us from God. Our sinfulness drives a wedge between us and God. And as we think about what, how things appear and how they actually are, we see how our lives can, in that way, at times be in that way. And we cry out with David, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. See, here we are, separated from God. A wedge between us. No excuse for our sinfulness. Yet God hears that plea our plea for mercy. God hears that plea that we make. I am a poor, miserable sinner. I confess that I've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. And He forgives us. He has mercy. He doesn't cast us from His presence like we deserve. He doesn't throw us out into the night to let thing, let whatever may be, be. But instead, He had that plan for us. He he chose us before time. He chose each one of us to redeem each of us. Before we even knew to pray for forgiveness, forgiveness was there. He sent Christ into our world. He sent Christ into our world to redeem us. To take our place. You heard in our second reading for today, that at times we are in that denial. That we do walk as those Pharisees. We swagger into church. We look around, in front of us, behind us, and we look at all those other sinners sitting there. And think about how good we happen to be. How we've done so well this week. But as the epistle said, if we do that, we are only deceiving ourselves, aren't we? Each of us needs to turn to our Lord for His mercy. Every week we confess our sins before God and before one another. Not because it's a practice of rote memory. Not because it's something we do just because it's part of the liturgy. But we do that. Because each of us, each week, over and over again, needs that forgiveness of sin. Each of, we, each of us, each week, needs to hear over and over again, You are forgiven. 
I have the wonderful opportunity of speaking God's forgiveness to you. By His authority, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are not my words ever, but they are God's words through me. God's promise of forgiveness for each one of you. And that promise comes because Christ did atone for each of us. And maybe you're not familiar with that word atonement. Maybe that word atonement is not one you use in day-to-day life. But I have a, a way that I've learned to remember it. It's a simple, simple mnemonic. At one minute. Christ has made us one again with God our Father. Through Christ's precious sacrifice on the cross, He took took away the barrier that divided us from God. Because of our sinful human nature, we were torn from God. A wall was built between us and God. We were sinners, only deserving death. And God, through great mercy, sent Christ, who tore the wall down that separated us, who brought us back, not because of something we did, but out of God's complete and perfect love for each one of us. We come before God as humbled sinners, recognizing that we are poor and miserable, that although we have been forgiven, that we still need that forgiveness. Each week we come and ask for confession, we come and confess our sins to receive that forgiveness. And each week God over and over again does forgive us. He makes us white as snow. He cleanses us. He wipes away the brokenness that separated us from Him and restores us fully. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done. That while, that while we, He was forsaken by the Father on the cross, He has never forsaken us. He's never forgotten us. But through His precious blood, He has redeemed us. As humbled Christians, as people before God, we have the beautiful opportunity to follow in in Christ's words and say, I forgive you to others. We have the opportunity not only to receive that forgiveness, but to also offer it. Right after Christ rose from the dead, He went to see the disciples. And He said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Christ has given us the power to say, I forgive you to people. Christ has given us the power to recognize how sinful we were, but then when someone comes to us to offer that forgiveness that he so willingly gave to us, when we come in confession and absolution, we say those words, It's almost the same as someone coming to us and saying, I'm sorry, I have sinned against you. And we, like Christ, have that opportunity to repeat the I forgive you. We have the opportunity to restore them. Probably are familiar with this. I believe it's Isaiah 53. The reference isn't exactly completely in my mind. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was punished for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. By Christ's wounds, we are healed. We are restored. And we are made whole in God's presence. Let us share that healing with others. Let us share that forgiveness. Because Christ has first forgiven us. We pray. O Christ, you are the true Lamb of God. Through through your death on the cross, you have made us one again with our Father. Through your gracious love for us, you have united us and you have made us whole. You have healed us in ways that we never expected. Lord, we pray that we would always look to you for this forgiveness. We pray that we would find strength in you, that we would find this forgiveness as you promise it. Lord, we look forward to the day when we will join you in heaven, separated from the brokenness of this world, celebrating the joy of our salvation. Help us, Lord, to share this peace to the ends of the earth. Help us to go forth 
sharing the forgiveness, the healing that You have promised. It is in Your precious and holy name, O Christ, we pray. Amen.